Welcome all of you to this live program about Greek principles. Today, our guest of honor is Professor Ivan Wong from Halifax, Canada. Dr. Wong is a professor of orthopedic surgery in the Department of Medicine, School of Health and Human Performance at the Dalhousie University in Halifax, Canada. He co-directs the Joint Preservation, Sports Medicine and Arthroscopy Fellowship Program. He received his master's in academic medicine from the University of Southern California, and he completed his fellowship as Dr. Stephen Snyder at the Southern California Orthopedic Institute. He's a certified fellow of the American Board of Orthopedic Surgeons and the Canadian Academy of Sports and Exercise Medicine. He's been the current president of the Arthroscopy Association of Canada and a member of the Arthroscopy Association of North America, Board of Directors. In addition, Dr. Wong serves as the editorial board of both the American Journal of Sports Medicine and the Arthroscopy Journal. Dr. Wong has been the 2022 recipient of Dr. Stephen Burkhardt Shoulder Innovation Research Award at the ANA and was awarded the 2022 Canadian Orthopedic Foundation Edward Sampson Award for Best Career Orthopedic Research in Canada. Dr. Wong has published over 160 peer-reviewed publications and has presented at approximately 170 conferences worldwide. If you've noticed, Professor Wong has delivered a lecture on a channel in the past and has already reached a huge audience. And today is my great honor to bring back Professor Ivan Wong for this wonderful live program. Over to you, Dr. Wong. Thank you very much for the invitation again to come back. You have a wonderful uh, following and a great description of, uh, of orthopedic uh, education. So again, it's my honor to be able to talk uh, about uh, arthroscopic bank cut repair. Uh, we'll talk about um, how to replicate the open bank heart from an inferior to superior capsular shift. I think it's a it's an art that really takes uh, a time to go to learn. So disclosures. Really, the arthroscopic uh, bank art technique um, has been the gold standard in North America, at least uh, over the past few decades. It's a suture anchor technique that requires three to four anchors. You placate the capsule uh, to attempt uh, to bring the tissue from inferior to superior, but it's not quite the same as an open uh, bank art. So an open bank art uh, without bone block, and we have a description here, uh, of how things go. And outcomes are actually really good for an open repair. So the recurrence rate is somewhere on 2%, which is much better than what we can see from an arthroscopic bank heart repair. And what the differences are, you can see here, is they do, again, a, a delta pectoral uh, interval release. Uh, so you can see if we go lateral to conjoint, you really can get into the joint to see how things are. You do damage the subscap, and that's really why uh, arthroscopic uh, uh, reconstructions are beneficial. And I'm getting this from the courtesy of our American colleagues, Dr. Dickens and Dr. Kilcoin. They have a lot of open procedures. And why I want to show this is the amount of shift. So this is the view that you can get from an open surgery. Again, subscap is off here. We're taking, they're taking the um the ligaments, right? The glenohumeral ligaments from inferior and shifting it, physically shifting it from inferior to superior. And this is what we want to be able to replicate arthroscopically. And currently with our techniques, with a bank art repair, where we elevate the capsule off, we cannot get the significant amount of shifting from inferior to superior so that we essentially close down that rotator interval. Again, this is what we want to be able to do. Bring it from inferior. Again, you can see here, multiple suture anchors on the face of the glenoid uh, with the subscap off to bring this tissue all the way up. So is there a way to do something like this so we can get the similar type of outcomes from an arthroscopic approach? Well, I think there is. So we've actually published our technique in 2020. You can see here in figure A with a bank art tear. Figure B, where we actually grab the tissue at three o'clock. This is a traction suture at three o'clock. So we can put a lasso loop into this area to be able to hold it. And then we split the tissue. This is a labral releasing stitch anterior to biceps between the biceps and the traction suture. And then with this traction suture, we're actually going to pull on it to shift the tissue. And we can actually measure the amount of shift. So in this example here, we shifted it from the three o'clock position all the way almost to the 12 o'clock position. And in the normal male, that's almost two centimeters to shift. So we can actually replicate to, re to close down that rotator interval by shifting the glenohumeral ligament superiorly. How does this look in the operating room? Well, we're going to show you this. This is how we do our setup. It's in a lateral view position. Um, that's because we can get a better view of it this way. 
Again, you can see me here. I tend to use augmented reality during surgery too to make this better and easier to do. These are the different portals we use. So viewing from the anterior aspect, uh, we have a posterior portal where we start, anterior superior portal where we view, and an anterior and inferior portal where we do all the working portal as well as where the traction suture comes from. So this is what it looks like. This is an example of a patient like this. This is a view from the posterior portal um, where we start off the procedure. You can see this person's actually dislocated quite a few numbers of times. Um, there's a very large Hill Sachs lesion in here. We're actually going to go through this live surgery. This surgery was done just a few weeks ago with my graduating fellow. So it's actually my graduating fellow that's doing the operation. I'm helping him guide him through this to be able to go through, but it highlights all the techniques that we want to do. Doing from posterior, you can see the shoulder actually has to be reduced to keep it in socket. That blue cannula is the anterior inferior portal. And we want that quite a ways away from the anterior superior portal so we don't get to any uh, scissoring as we do the surgery. And as we come in here, you can see that anterior labrum is completely detached. And there's actually not much tissue. So viewing from the back, it's actually very tough to see. And why I'm showing you this part is we usually look at this this way as we view from the back to say, look, this isn't a good enough view. We need to view it from the anterior superior portal. So we're doing either B share or lateral or lateral diffusion setup. You always want to view from the anterior superior portal because you can see the tissue much more clearly in this case, in, in any case, the view from the anterior superior portal. So the first step of doing an inferior to superior shift for a banker or pair is really to open up this rotator interval. The rotator interval tissue is extremely thin. As you can see here, this shaver in here is just barely doing some suction. And when we shave it out, what we want to do is leave all the labrum. So we're actually not going to touch the labrum. We're going to open up that rotator interval. And the whole point of this is to see the CA ligament and the conjoined tendon. So hopefully right now you can see we're pulling the head back. You can see here he's dislocated so much that he's actually getting changes in his cartilage. But this line down here is the CA ligament. The muscle behind there is the deltoid and the pec, right? So the deltoid pectoral intervals up anterior to this. So you can see CA ligament here. Once we see the CA ligament, now we want to continue the opening of the rotator interval. So we see conjoint tendon. So hopefully now with the head reduced, you can actually see down here on the lower right side, there is conjoint. There's the edge of conjoint coming up. And the way to see this is really pulling the head posteriorly opens up the space between the subscap, which is the first tissue right here, there's subscap, and anterior to subscap, which is the conjoint. And so you have to pull the head posteriorly to retract subscap posteriorly. And that's how you see the conjoint tendon. So that's opening up the rotator interval. All this uh, view here is going at one-to-one -one speed, just so that we can have a description of what's going on. And here is the needle coming down to identify our anterior superior portal. So you can see the angle of the approach is significantly different. I want that needle to come down here because now we're actually opening the skin and then putting a switching stick in the same spot. So again, going through our rotator uh, uh, interval opening. And you can see in the straight line, it heads down where the bank arc tear was. Excuse me. Excuse me where the bank art tear was to be able to visualize. Now I put the scope into that, um, into that anterior superior portal where we just put that switching stick. I'm looking back at the posterior portal where we were just looking from. And this posterior portal, you can see the amount of uh, hemocidrin stains, the amount of synovitis. You see all the spraying of this tissue. That was from the number of dislocations going on. You can see the humeral head directly ahead of us the uh, hill sax lesion right there. So there's a, quite a significant and actually you know, quite a medial hill sax lesion there. <clears throat> so with all that, we know that we're gonna have to deal with this. So this is gonna be an inferior to superior capsular shift as well as a rumpusage. We'll go through all these things together. First step is we're assessing that posterior portal. We put a cannula in here. We can identify this posterior labrum. Looks like it's a bit off, but I don't see any sign of it. It's still attached. He's not getting much tissue, much issue back here. So we're not really going to deal with it. We're not, we're not looking for more work to do because that doesn't look unstable posteriorly to me. It looks more unstable post anteriorly. So we actually use a probe to be able to measure the amount of bone loss. And in this case, again, you can see there is quite a bit of bone loss, but this patient is actually part of a, one of our randomized studies right now. We're trying to compare 
uh, um, our bone block technique versus a soft tissue repair. So this patient got randomized to a uh, all soft tissue repair, which means a bank heart repair with a rump massage. So an inferior to superior capsular shift. And we're measuring from the edge of the cuff to the uh, edge of the hill sac. So that looked like it was about 20 millimeters. Anteriorly here, you can see the quality of the soft tissue. The humeral head is actually sitting anterior to that bone. It's sitting on the soft tissue. And that soft tissue doesn't look very good. If you look at it, you can actually almost see right through it and see muscle belly. So if we do a native, a regular type of a bank heart repair, we haven't done any release here on the bank heart. If you do a regular bank heart repair, trying to bring this tissue back, I would say the tissue is going to be very poor. And in, in, in uh, my experience, when you're trying to repair this, as you tie that suture together, it will tear through that capsular tissue. And this has always been my difficulty when I was doing a bank heart repair, when I would elevate all this tissue with a liberator knife and try to placate this tissue, try to figure out where I want to grab this tissue to bring it up. So that has never worked out quite as well as I wanted and probably why we had a higher failure rate than we wanted. So the technique now is exactly what we showed before, exactly in our technique uh, uh, guide that we published. We grab the tissue at three o'clock. So I'm trying to look at the capsule and labral complex at approximately the three o'clock position. So here it is right here. We're grabbing the tissue at three o'clock. Um, to me, that looks like it's about three o'clock, maybe even a little lower than three o'clock. I'm grabbing both a capsule and whatever remnant labrum there is. And honestly, there's really no labrum here, but I want a full thickness grab because this is going to be a tracking stitch of which I'm going to lift that capsule labral complex uh, uh, anterior and superiorly so I can do a really good uh, um, release of this tissue. But you can see I could have gone even more medially here, but I'm really just trying to grab this tissue. So just take a look and remember the quality of this tissue. It's not good, and I'd be really worried that, that this would pull through and I would not have a good bank cart uh, repair. So with the traction suture placed, we're pulling the two limbs of the suture out. So this is what's going to be a racking suture. We just pulled that, that, uh, that uh, um, super shuttle through. We're now going to come in and grab the other limbs of that suture so we can get a, um, so we can get a traction stitch. So you can see here, um, we're looking again from the anterior superior portal. Uh, we'll get our grasper in here. Again, we're trying to try and make sure we're grabbing it around the same side of the biceps tendon. So here we go. This is going to be the same side coming in here, getting our grasper. Once we organize our uh, camera angle to view this as appropriately as possible, that is going to be our traction suture. So once we pull on those, we now have a loop on one side, two tails on the other. If we feed the tails through the loop, we can actually pull it down and we have a circumferential, what we call a racking stitch on that anterior uh, capsule and labral tissue at the three o'clock position on the glenoid. So we exteriorize this. So you can see my can is being pushed back down. We exteriorize this, which means we put the sutures outside of the cannula. And so now I can have good control. I can put traction on it, which means the snap or, or a kind of a, a, um, a grasper is, is held on so that the traction suture is taut outside onto the skin. Now what we do is we actually release the tissue between the, between the traction stitch and the biceps tendon. So here we go. This is the biceps tendon. I'm going to go, if this is 12 o'clock at the biceps tendon, I'm going to go roughly at the one o'clock. So taking more tissue from the biceps side, because this is where I want to put the last anchor at the very end. We're planning for what we want to do because we want to reattach the labrum from the traction stitch, which is at three o'clock, back at the 12 to one o'clock position. So I want to be able to see this. And this is not a typical part of the procedure that most people describe for a bank art repair because. Uh, before we had good uh, anchors, we weren't able to consistently get things to heal. Now that we have really good knotless anchors, I know I can take that traction stitch and dock it back onto the anterior rim of glenoid and be able to get that to heal uh, uh, consistently. So we release that, by, uh, that, uh, that labrum, as you can see here. And the very next thing we look for is a coracoid. 
So the anterior myoglenoid, so you can see this is, um, that was the uh, anterior myoglenoid. Right down below that is going to be the inferior edge of the corpoid. And once we release this and skeletonize the inferior edge of the corpoid, we can be able to see, uh, uh, we can be able to see that we're freeing up the capsule labral complex from the anterior myoglenoid. And why this is important is usually people use a liberator knife or a bankart knife, they call it, off the anterior rim and, and free it up from the lateral edge medially. And the problem with doing that with a sharp knife is we lose the tissue. So why I want you to focus on this is I'm taking a cautery probe, freeing up from the medial side. So I'm trying to start at muscle belly and free laterally towards the articular cartilage. So down here, you can see right here, there's some uh, adhesion. This is really where the periosteum attaches to the native plenoid. And by doing it from the muscle side, we're able to preserve even more tissue. In fact, we're able to get more tissue because that's the periosteum. I want to take the periosteum and lift it with the capsule labral complex. So here you can see, again, there's muscle belly. We're freeing it up laterally and taking the periosteum with us. And so this is why I'm actually giving you less edited video so you can see how we do this. Taking this tissue, we can get better quality tissue. So take a look here. That's muscle belly. There's periosteum. We can get this tissue that we normally could not get if we use a liberator knife from the articular surface going down towards the bone. And we take it all up in a free area here. So we're going all the way. Now we can see I'm taking just the last little bit of fiber so we can see the muscle belly very cleanly and going down inferiorly all the way down to six o'clock. Now, the typical cautery probe I use is an angled probe, and I find that angled probe allows you to reach a little bit better. It's more uh, uh, congruent to the, to the anterior face of glenoid. So again, I'm not facing the labrum tissue. I'm not facing the capsule tissue. I'm actually using the cautery probe facing the bone. So I'm using the edges of it to release it. So I'm not losing any tissue. I'm just elevating it off. And again, using this cautery probe, really, so it doesn't cause bleeding. Because you know, if you're using that, that bankrupt knife, it's always bleeding down here. It's hard to see. In this way, we're freeing out the tissue. It's actually quite easy to see. There's obviously a little bit of bleeding that you'll have, but we're getting it freed up all the way to muscle belly. And here, I can actually bring that tissue up. So I'm freeing that tissue up. And previously, our predecessors would say that you want to make this labrum float. So that's what we're doing. This is actually floating back at the level of the glenoid. So you can see the glenoids here. We're letting it float. All the tissues actually reduce back to the right level. I want to do a release that's past six o'clock. So this is six o'clock here. Now I use that liberator knife. This is the bank card knife. I'm going to extend it past six o'clock. The cautery doesn't work here because it's not strong enough or stiff enough. So I'm actually going to use this part to free up this tissue because I actually have very good anterior tissue now. The inferior tissue tends not to be as good, but I do want to angle this down because we do know the nerve is more on the humeral side. I want to have this hook and angle down towards the glenoid side so I don't have any chance of injuring the nerve. So I want to go past six o'clock. This is six o'clock right here. Usually to about seven o'clock. If they have a posterior labral tear too, I'll continue this all the way around to the edge of the posterior labral tear. But you can see all the way down here, this capsule labral complex actually looks quite stable. So I don't think it's a circumferential labral tear. I don't think it's a 270 degree labral tear. I just want to release it to seven o'clock so that I have more room to shift that capsule anteriorly and superiorly because the end goal again is to get that traction stitch all the way up to 12 o'clock to get a really good reduction and a really good shift to that tissue. So hopefully I'm emphasizing this enough. You can see the humeral head keeps subluxating anteriorly because there's nothing supporting it anymore. We are actually reducing the head posteriorly to be able to visualize this, as well as to get this uh, liberator knife uh, to be able to get to the very, this probably is past seven o'clock. We're getting to probably 7.30 right here. We're just trying to do just enough of a release so that we can get that inferior glenoid Couch of the uh, inferior glenohumeral ligament uh, reduced, shifted anteriorly, and superiorly. So once we do that, now we can start working on the next part. So the anterior capsule is released. 
all the way past six o'clock, all the way to seven o'clock, in fact. Now we're going to deal with the Hill Sachs lesion. And this Hill Sachs lesion, this one's a more of a medial Hill Sachs. You can see there's that lateral edge, this, this edge right here that I'm using the chair for. There's actually very little damage to that because the dislocation was so far, we actually have quite a deep Hill Sachs lesion. So here's a curette. This is actually one of my hip curettes. It doesn't matter. Ring curette is the nicest way to be able to decorticate this bone. Obviously, you don't want to take away too much of the cortex bone because that bone will help the anchor stay in place. We free this up, again, taking away that tissue. Our goal is to have bleeding bone because that's what it's going to heal. We've done rump massages this way, and we've seen second looks, and we do know that it heals very well with the technique that we use. And I use a double double pulley technique, as you'll see. This is the least number of passes through the rotator cuff to get tissue to heal into the space. And the whole point of a rump massage isn't really a cuff repair, so we don't need a whole bunch of sutures. We just want the cuff to actually insert into this Hill Sachs lesion to exteriorize this Hill Sachs lesion so that it cannot engage. So what I want to do is take the least amount of tissue here on the infraspinatus and the teres minor, to attach this into the defect of the, uh, of the hill sacs. So we've actually took down that tissue with the curette. I use a shaver or whatever we need to take out any of those loose pieces. And now once we got healing potential here, we can decide on how we're gonna put our anchors. And the plan for this would be to put our anchors percutaneously to the least amount of tissue to reduce it into this hill sacs defect. So sometimes the uh, curettes are not the right angle. So then I can use a liberator knife as well. You can see this again, this liberator or bank cart knife, whatever you want to call it. I can use this to scrape down that cartilage. And again, I don't want cartilage or anything in here to give you a fibrous healing of that, uh, that capsule and, and, uh, and rotator cuff into the hill sacs lesion. I want to make sure we have good potential, good bleeding potential here to have healing between the two anchors, because we're going to put two anchors into a mattress type of configuration for, uh, for a repair. I want to have lots of healing potential in here to be able to make that work. So once this is off, we can now, again, I'm just using a shaver in here. We're going to start working on how we're going to get our anchor into the right spot. So I'm just going to sneak through here. So our first anchor going in, this is the most inferior anchor of uh, our repair. So this is uh, a percutaneous approach. We have a cannula through the skin, through the deltoid into the subacromial space. Once we feel that we're on top of the, um, the, the infraspinatus, we poke through it with our drill guide. This is a Q-fix drill guide. We poke through it to get a all suture anchor into the inferior aspect of the hill sacs lesion. You can see we're inferior here because this is the labrum. This is the inferior aspect of the hill sacs lesion. This again is the right shoulder. We're looking from the anterior superior portal. You can see the rest of the hill sacs lesion as I pull the camera back. I'm deploying the anchor right now. And this anchor guide is inside a cannula in the deltoid. So then we're able to slide the cannula up more superiorly, put the drill guide through the now infraspinatus uh, tendon. Again, this tendon is very close to the insertion onto the greater tuberosity. And now we can drill through the superior aspect. So again, hopefully you can see here, you'll look past this drill. Our last sutures, our inferior sutures are as far away from this as possible at the inferior aspect of the hill sacs lesion. And once we put the can, once we put the anchor in the superior portion, we can actually fixate this. And once I pull this uh, drill guide out, you can see that we have two sets of sutures through here. These are single loaded, all suture anchors. So with an active deployment, so that it doesn't pull through this soft bone on the hill sacs area. So you can see here, this is one set and you see the other set. This actually is a double loaded suture anchor. You see two sets of colors and having two different colors is helpful. So we can tell which set of sutures we're gonna pull on to be able to repair this. Once we get those hill sacs uh, uh, anchors through, we can actually pull on those uh, suture anchors and you can see that helps us reduce the shoulder back on top of the glenoid. And now we can focus on the bank art repair. So those sutures again, allow us to pull the head back. This is the six o'clock using the same suture anchor guide. 
uh, a similar suture anchor guide, we're able to drill this. So this is a, this is a, uh, I believe this is a um, peak anchor that we're going to put in here. We can drill it at that six o'clock position um, right here, where you can see right at that very tip. We try to go on the face. So you got to make sure that there's tissue. You got to remember the bone in the anterior rim here is very thin. You saw the cancellous bone right here. We want to have a ring of cortical bone around this suture anchor. So that's why I'm just off the face. It's less than half of the diameter of this uh, drill guide. So we got less than one millimeter of bone here because I want to make sure that uh, the anchor will not pull out. So once we drill this all the way in, we can then pass an anchor. And then we can uh, uh, deploy the anchor and hopefully it stays in this right spot. If we ever drill off, which means if we actually drill on the edge, it's going to pull out because we put a lot of tension on this repair when we tie it down. Um, this one again is a peak type of anchor. We have to mallet it in. It has a very thin suture in here, which allows us to grab the tissue. But once we get the anchor in, now it becomes suture management. So there's a stitch. We can grab one of the, we're testing it. Obviously we're pulling on that anchor. We can test, we can uh, grab one of those suture limbs from the posterior portal, that green portal in the back here with a suture grasper. So we grab one of these suture bands out. This is a, uh, this is a um, um, suture tape. It's more flat, so it allows our knots to lie down lower. We'll pull the head back. And now when we pull the head back, we're going to use the anterior inferior, anterior inferior portal for our spectrum, for our suture passer device. But we're also going to put tension on the traction stitch. Remember, the traction stitch was grabbed at 3 o'clock. So once we get in position here, see I'm at the anchor. I'm ready to grab the tissue. So all I want to do is grab the tissue at the right spot. Now I'm pulling on that traction stitch. You can see that tension on this uh, capsule labral complex. With the tension on the capsule labral complex, I'm, a lot, I'm able to, to circumferentially grab all that tissue. So you can see, hopefully, I'm right at the junction between the capsule labral complex, as facts, this is periosteum, and the muscle belly. The muscle belly is right below this. So I'm actually getting a better grab of the tissue. I can see better. I can grab better. And now we can grab this out the posterior portal and shuttle that suture we grabbed out the posterior portal back through the capsule labral complex. So hopefully you're able to see now, we don't have to figure out how much tissue we want to grab as a typical bank heart repair. Because most of the time when we do this or try to teach a bank heart repair a traditional way, arthroscopically, everyone asks, how much tissue do you grab for a bank heart repair? In this case, we are grabbing the exact amount of tissue that the reduction happens when we pull on that traction stitch. And you can see here, with traction off of that stitch, the suture is coming immediately underneath that capsule labral complex in the junction between the capsule labrum and the muscle belly. I'm going to reduce the head now so that I can tie this knot. And before I tie this knot, I'm going to pull on a traction stitch because, again, I want to shift that tissue. If I forget to pull that traction stitch, I'm going to tie the suture, and it's just going to hold the, the capsule labral complex exactly where it is. It won't hold it after where the shift is going to be, which is where I past the suture. Hopefully that makes sense. Here we go. We're going to start uh, pulling that suture and then we'll start pushing that knot down. So again, pulling and pushing the knot down. The knot's coming down to a certain point and I want the suture to be 90 degrees to that tissue. So I'm actually not going to push it down this way. I'm actually going to slide it down anteriorly and inferiorly so that it's in the right spot. So here I am I'm just adjusting the view. I slide my suture passer, or the sorry, this knot higher um, anteriorly and inferiorly with traction. You can see I'm pulling on the traction stitch. And now this is actually pulling that tissue to the right spot. <coughs> we'll do the other half hitches to reinforce that knot. And then once we do that, we can move on to our second suture. <clears throat> Hopefully, you can already see now. The shoulder looks much more stable. We do know that shoulder uh, gets more stable after you put your first anchor in in the bank heart repair. But I'll tell you, again, when I do my normal bank heart repair, if I don't do this shift and don't do this label releasing stitch, 
it doesn't reduce the head as well as it does when I do this releasing stitch. So you'll see here, I'm cutting that suture. The head now is nicely balanced, right? It's balanced exactly where it is. Sometimes, in fact, we can get it balanced to, so that it sits a little more posteriorly. So we can get quite a bit of shift in here, but you really can't over-reduce it if you leave the arm in neutral rotation. So right now, my arm's in neutral rotation, which means the thumb is pointing straight up towards the ceiling. I'll get my next suture anchor guide in. So this is the next drill guide. Again, I want this on the face of the glenoid. And I want at least a millimeter of bone anterior to this, really so that the suture anchor doesn't pull out. I don't want it on the corner because that corner bone is very weak. So here it is going through. And I'm actually going to just skip this part a little bit here because I don't think that's as important. Um, I want to show you the quality of the tissue after I put the anchor in. So here's the anchor going in after the drill. We're going to pull the suture anchor out the back right here. And then I want to show you the suture passing again, because I think that's the whole point of this, is once we get the suture anchor out the posterior aspect, we're going to pull, we're going to go grab this tissue. And again, I'm trying to show you this in real time, like it's a live surgery, so you can see all the decision making going on as opposed to a fully edited video. So here we go here. You can see a suture anchor. Uh, this is our suture passer coming in. I'm pulling the head back to see. I can identify where the anchor is. So I actually only grab where the anchor is. So I'm gonna actually go just a, maybe a hair lower. So between the two, so I can get tension on it. I rotate my suture uh, passer around. I make sure I can grab the full thickness capsule labral complex that we had. And I'm pulling on the traction suture at the same time so that there's tension in the anterior aspect. And I wanna come through right here which is right through the muscle to labrum interface, right? Because we've freed it up all the way to there. So you're going to be able to see me come through if I can get it to the right spot. And it's coming through right about now. Again, full thickness. Hopefully you can see. It actually sure makes it tough because you can see the quantity of, oh, actually, it looks like I had to go two times. The quantity of the uh, soft tissue here, we have a lot more soft tissue because we're able to take that periosteal tissue here. And that's very thick, very strong tissue that we can actually grab with this uh, uh, suture passer. So again, couldn't grab it all the way that time. We just want to make a twist. And the twist of the suture passer is really just a 90 degree twist. So we can come out parallel with the glenoid surface. So it looks like it's about to come out there it comes right here. We just keep uh, wiggling to make sure it gets out to the right spot. So that's a full thickness grab. I like that spot. We're going to speed this through just a tiny little bit here because I think you get the concept of this. There's a suture passing. We'll slide it back around. And then this is actually the best part we can get. I'm using this. Um, uh, uh, suture grasper, this loopy suture grasper, to keep that uh, limb of the suture as I tie inferiorly. And this will allow us to have a better quality uh, soft tissue anteriorly because we're going to pull on that traction suture, that green suture again. When we push this knot down, we'll be able to pull this so that this limb of the suture stays inferior and it pulls all that capsule labral complex superiorly. So here it comes down, the knot's coming down. You can see the traction suture is actually very close to it. Once it gets close, we'll grab this suture again, suture limb again. We'll pull this inferiorly, just like you saw there, so that we're actually going to pull this uh, capsule labral complex superiorly. We'll pull on the traction suture, so now you can't see that green suture limb anymore. There's the green suture limb. We're pulling it as much as we can to shift it. And once we get good grab of it, like you see here, we're now going to tie that down. So here we go. We pull that knot pusher, push it on the capsular side so it's away from the articular surface, pulling on the traction suture, and we'll tie this down. So take a look at this. This is much thicker tissue than we had initially. Remember, this is also periosteal tissue. So I'm much more happy. When I started doing this way, it's much better in terms of the quality of tissue. And the very last, not the very last thing, the very next thing we want to do after we tie this, I'm going to skip the tie here. 
is we're going to take that green suture and be able to show you how close we can get. We're going to cut this suture here. How close we can get back to the 12 o'clock position. Nope, for some reason that just disappeared. I'm sorry for that. Just had a little freezing of this thing. We'll go right here. So this is now 12 o'clock, right? We have our last suture down here. This is 12 o'clock. This is the green traction stitch right beside biceps here. So we're able to get the whole repair back to the 12 o'clock or just close to the 12 o'clock position. And hopefully you remember the traction stitch is three o'clock, moving it all the way to 12 o'clock. Now we have our remplissage left to take care of. So I'm moving the camera posteriorly. You can see the two suture limbs from the two anchors we put in. Remember, there's still a uh, cannula through the deltoid and the bursal surface where we put those two percutaneous suture anchors. And all we have to do now is tie them back together. So outside the cannula, I know you can't see here, we just didn't have an outside camera at the time to tie this. This is us tying it down. When we tie the two sutures together, it ties the rumpusage, ties those capsules back onto the humeral head. And you can see this decreases that space so that we'll engage in the end. And then our final view with the shoulder back in socket in a neutral position. So we actually went on to compare these outcomes. So the way we do it now, which is the capsular shift from inferior to superior compared with the gold standard, which is the arthroscopic bank heart repair, where you have three to four anchors uh, with a bank heart knife not releasing that labral stitch. And we followed them for at least two years. And so we looked at this from 2015 to 2021. Uh, we had 114 cases. We had some other cases that we had to exclude because they didn't. They had other uh, lesions in there that didn't wasn't a clean uh, set. So we had about 27 bank hearts and 38 capsular shifts in there. Our mean age was somewhere around 30. Uh, clinical follow up was uh, five years for bank hearts, mainly because we do it for longer periods of time. Just over two years for capsular shift. Um, mostly, again, most of these patients were male, as typical for shoulder instability. What we found was both groups, so both groups, both Bankart shift on the left, capsular shift on the right, had comparable improvements in Wolsey score. But there was a higher percentage, you can see on the figure on the right here, of capsular shift patients that met MCID compared to the Bankart shift. So 90% of our capsular shift patients met MCID, which is minimal clinical important difference, of which only 75% of those met it in the regular Bankart repair. And when we looked at it even more closely, of those with the capsular shift, we got 90% of them that were successfully repaired, meaning they did not have any apprehension or dislocation. In our capsular shift group, there was one of each. In our bank heart repair, there was almost 26% that had apprehension or dislocation. So a significant difference, uh, or it was approaching significant, that was um, between these two groups. Both groups had comparable preoperative glenoid AP dimensions, so it was not a bone loss a difference between these two groups or a hill sax difference uh, between these two groups. So capsular shift seems to be more beneficial uh, at the two-year outcome after surgery. Uh, they have a lower per percentage of apprehension or dislocation, and they had a higher percentage of patient, which meant MCID for the Wolsey score. So this likely is better because the capsular shift can help address that capsular volume reduction. Um, and that's probably the most important part that the open repair does uh, compared to the arthroscopic bank heart repair. So in summary, capsular shift technique that we're showing here are getting better results than an average two-year follow-up compared to a bank heart repair uh, uh, done without releasing that labral tissue. We're getting a lower recurrence rate, lower apprehension rate, and a better MCID rate. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Wong. Uh, thank you, Professor Wong, for this wonderful presentation, detailed surgical technique. You're welcome. Uh, yeah. Uh, Dr. Wong, uh, let's have a short Q&A. Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Wong, is there any level one data available that compares capsular shift with bunk card already? Is there enough data? No. So there's no level one data. In fact, we developed this technique after doing our AAGR, our uh, arthroscopic anatomic Leonard reconstruction, where we do bone block. So to do a bone block, we did have to do this labral release. 
And what we learned when we're doing this labor release is this was a better shift than I was doing with my regular bank card repair. So we actually shifted that technique from the AAGR to a regular bank card. And so now we just went back to look to see, did this actually make a difference for a regular bank card? So this is a, a, a prospective comparative study. So a level two study, not a level one study. Our level two study with two-year follow-up now suggests that this capture shift is better. So that's actually our very next step. Our next step is to do a level one study, you know, so that we're trying to eliminate as much bias as we can um, that, uh, that we can compare the two. So now that we're finishing our level two study, that's our next job is do a level one. But we're trying to show this technique because I don't see any inherent uh, complications or risks to do it this way. And has anyone else done this? So, so far, our trainees are doing this, right? So everyone who's done a fellowship with us to do a bank card repair. We've had numerous surgeons around the world so far uh, uh, learn from our techniques with uh, virtual broadcasts, like we tried to coordinate ourselves. We have surgeons that want to learn the AGR and don't travel, can't travel to Halifax. So we actually do a lot of surgical broadcasts uh, so they can actually come join me in the operating room, watch from start to finish, ask questions. And when they do that, they realize the benefit of the surgery techniques that we do. So they incorporate it and they email me back. So there, there's uh, hundreds of surgeons so far. We've done this several hundred times now since COVID uh, that are doing this technique. And Dr. Wong, what has been the recurrence rates with these procedures, the AGR and the capsular shift? Because traditionally what we all, I mean, it was said that, okay, arthroscopic uh, approach to shoulder instability was associated with a slightly higher recurrence rate. Has it come down? Because we have a lot of advances that has happened, like nautilus anchors, a lot of things, right? Absolutely. So these are very good points. We're actually coming up with a chapter right now. We're writing on all these different advances with the shoulder instability and what to do uh, for each of the different cases. What we're finding is when there's bone loss, it doesn't matter what we do, even with open bank art shifts or whatnot, there's a, there's a number. And what is the number going to be? We're trying to identify the number right now, but it's somewhere around 10 to 15 percent of filling out bone loss that no matter what you do with the soft tissue repair, open or arthroscopic, your failure rate is going to be higher than not. Our new technology of knotless repairs and things like that have not really changed the rate of recurrent instability per se. It's made surgery easier, more consistent, and less failure for not loosening, but it hasn't changed the long-term outcomes of shoulder instability surgery. The things that have changed though, we're finding is this bank art shift, this inferior to superior shift, helps for at least for a two-year outcome. And again, two-year outcome is not long enough. We need to follow these people longer, but I think we do a better job compared to the arthroscopic, classic arthroscopic bank card repair. It's more similar to the open bank card repair. So I think it has, ha has a better chance to do more for patients with very little change in our surgical technique. For AEGR, where we add bone arthroscopically through the Halifax portal, our outcomes have been Fantastic, actually. They've they've approached a ladder J very easily. We have now five-year outcomes. We've demonstrated that the last uh, AAOS meeting, so Academy, as well as Anna, uh, we recently just won the award for that, um, to show our five-year data has very little subluxation or dislocation rates. We're approaching the exact same numbers we would with a ladder J. So we don't have long-term data yet. So this is minimum five-year. Our average is outwards of seven years. It, it suggests that this could be a potential uh, uh, long-term solution that we are currently using ladder day for. Thank you, Dr. Wong. Uh, Dr. Wong, interestingly, I had hosted uh, Alan Hirahara from Sacramento, California before. And uh, we looked at, again, we discussed about this recurrence rate. And one of the things that came to my mind was we commonly miss an extension beyond the six o'clock, six to eight. And that could be one of the reasons for recurrences. And if we address that, then our recurrences would come down significantly. What's your take on that? I think if we miss any lesions, then absolutely. We are, as a surgeon, we're missing the mark and we're not doing a good job in what we plan to do. So surgery is very different from how the rest of healthcare is. We can't just do randomized studies and expect one surgery to be the same as another surgeon uh, oh, sorry, one surgery to do the same as another surgery, one surgeon to do the same as another surgeon. As surgeons, we are the medication, we are the treatment. And if we're not at our best and we make mistakes, then they come into play with patient outcomes. So I completely agree with you. If you miss a lesion, if you miss the lesion from six to eight o'clock, 
then we are not doing the patient good no matter what we do, whether it's a bone loss procedure, whether it's a shoulder instability procedure. This is our understanding of, of the pathology. And this is where I encourage everyone to do more. So uh, again, I meant to have my overhead camera, but every time we do surgery, I print out 3D models because I'm much better at understanding the anatomy. We're about to come out with more papers to show that anatomy is not what we were taught in medical school. Not everyone's acromion is in the same spot. You cannot say you do a posterior portal, two centimeters medial, two centimeters inferior to get a perfect posterior portal because we haven't defined a post perfect posterior portal. To me, a perfect posterior portal is something that's going to be allow you to get perfectly parallel with the glenoid and right in the very center of the bone defect because that's what I want to be able to uh, repair for shoulder instability surgery. For shoulder instability surgery, that's my posterior portal. And that's my perfect posterior portal. The position is only 50% of the time in what I just finished describing, two center medial, two center inferior. More times than not, the acromion is changed. The posterior corner is changed. There, in fact, sometimes there's two posterior corners, depending on which one you want to look at. And that's why I do a 3D print of every single shoulder instability we do. Same thing with the humerus. The hill sacs in a different location every time. And so without these 3D models and without looking at this in a three-dimensional structure with a CT, we're going to miss that information. Great. Thanks. That's great information. And Dr. Wong, uh, what's your approach for a Hagel lesion, a humor level lesion of lean humor? Is it open or arthroscopic? So uh, again, I think you can do any approach. So my approach is arthroscopic, mainly because I find I can see things better arthroscopically. I'm a better arthroscopic surgeon than I'm an open surgeon. There are surgeons that are better open than arthroscopic. It honestly doesn't matter. The concept is the same. You need to be able to, I, number one, identify a Hagel lesion. And I'll tell you, I missed a Hagel lesion early in my career and I didn't recognize it because I didn't know what I was looking for. So anytime I see the subscap muscle belly, and don't see capsule, that's a Hagel lesion. And I will never forget that operation because I record every single surgery. And I look back to this day, I can't believe I missed that. And if Dr. Snyder was watching this video right now, he would say he taught me that. And that's very true. But we will have make mistakes. We're still human beings. Um, and this is something that we learned. And because now I can see it, I can identify it. There's all the tools to do this. We need to reattach that torn tissue off the humerus and I can do it better arthroscopically because of the tools we have. We have options of five o'clock portals, seven o'clock portals, curved suture anchor guides. We have 70 degree scopes, 30 degree scopes, uh, anterior superior portals of view, and then lateral views. So all those, a combination of any of those things will allow me to reattach that tissue back to the humerus. Thank you, Dr. Wong. Dr. Wong, I think that's all the questions that we have for the session. Thank you for this wonderful surgical technique. And I'm sure this is going to benefit a lot of people all over the world. Thank you for having me. Have a wonderful